good morning everyone or good afternoon no matter where you are around this world of ours. My name is Stuart Rees and I work for the Australian Trade and Investment Commission, otherwise known as Austrade in India. In addition to being the Trade and Investment Promotion Agency for the Australian Government, we also play a role in promoting international study in Australia and with others also in growing collaboration and partnership with the Australian and Indian education sector. Thank you all for joining us today in this masterclass on the future of space, turning science, science fiction in reality in the classroom to be held with our special guest from Australia, Dr. Brad Tucker. I'll firstly start with some housekeeping information. So today's session is going to last for about one hour and 30 minutes. We'll be taking questions at the end of the session, but during the session, please feel free to type your questions into the chat window on the side of the panel. My colleague Neha Grover in India will be moderating this session and the questions. Now we are recording this session, so please be aware of that, but mostly I wanted to tell you that so that you'll have the chance to share this session with other colleagues that might be actually unavailable to join us today. Please note that the audio quality might fluctuate during the webinar. And in case you have some audio issues, please just check your headset and your audio settings. And if the issues still persist, please disconnect and connect in back again. And in case we have any network disruptions, please stay online and we'll be connecting back in a few minutes. We're expecting up to 10,000 participants in today's webinar, so bandwidth may be an issue for us, but we will cope with this as best we will. I'd now like to pass to Catherine Gallagher, the Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner and General Manager South Asia for Austrade, who is based at the High Commission in Delhi. Catherine, please, over to you. Uh, Catherine, good morning. Uh, over to you. Catherine or Brad, were you able to hear me? Yes, Stuart, uh, we are able to hear you. I yeah. think Catherine's uh, audio is disconnected now. Okay. I'll just quickly give her a call. Thank you. All of our participants, please bear with us. Um, I think most of you can hear me, but one of our uh, first presenters is just having a little bit of technical problem. Um, we will be back um, and uh, get started again in just a moment with Catherine Gallagher's remarks. Thank you. Uh, Stuart, uh, Catherine is facing some connectivity issues. Uh, would request you to just uh, do the brief and pass it on to Dr. Saha for the introduction. She'll come in at the end. Okay, look, we'll do that. So, um, Catherine, if you can hear me, um, I'll ask you to perhaps say a few words at the um, end of the session or if you are online bef uh, just before I introduce Brad. Um, in the meantime, I'd li now like to ask Dr. Biswajit Saha, who's the Director of Training from the Central Board of Secondary Education to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Saha. Uh, thank you, Stuart. 
Uh, good afternoon, everybody. All eminent dignitaries on the panel, Brett, Catherine, Christina, Neha, and all the participants uh, from CBSC affiliated school, both school leader and senior teacher. It's a really a, a great moment for all of us uh, just to kick off the first masterclass series for the CBSC school leader and, and teacher. It's a really a good opportunity for all of us to hear varied area, uh, starting from the science fictions to COVID classroom and, and that pedagogical aspects. So, so lot many areas, I think, uh, teacher, educators all across CBSC school are going to listen to you and trying to interact with you with the question and session so that overall dynamics of education and how we can really engage the classroom and future mind with the requirement of 21st century uh, skill. So keeping all these in view, first of all, let me convey my sincere thanks to Australian government and Austria, and of course, all the university leaders to agree uh, to have this kind of uh, masterclass series for the CBSE school leader. I think Australia, India, we, we are having a cordial relations and how we can uh, really take up the student's mindset uh, change as a, as a mission mode uh, so that ultimately in these global pandemic situations, how we can encourage our teacher so that future classroom can be more engaging. And I think storytelling pedagogy to science fiction and sports to uh, ancient traditional values so all these things require to be discussed in the classroom in a manner, and we as a teacher must have that capability to weave our story in a manner so that ultimately our students get the benefits out of it to face the future all kinds of challenges. And, and thank you, Neha, and of course that all, all team members of uh, Australia and I believe there are multiple universities are uh, going to address our uh, teacher and school leader and more and more interactive sessions will be there. And in future also, we aim to have more this kind of master classes or even we aim rather one step further. Once this pandemic situation gets over, we, will, we are uh, rather agreeing or aiming to nominate some of our school leaders to your country to visit uh, the school systems, education systems, university systems, so that a coherence can be built up and more and more such interactions will really minimize the gap in, in, in a different directions. Rather, of course, the futures of space will be unlike the bird can fly from one uh, 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 locations to other locations without visa, I think, these kind of situations we are aiming to have here so that education, the flow of education really prevails whatever maybe the situation comes. With this note, uh, once again, welcome all the participant principal and teachers to this forum and thank you. Thank you, Australia and Australian government for uh, taking these steps in a positive note. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baha. I'd now like to pass to Catherine Gallagher, who is our Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner and General Manager for South Asia and based at the High Commission in Delhi. Uh, Catherine, I believe you are online now. I you where I went earlier, but I'm back. So firstly, I would really like to acknowledge Dr. Saha and also Dr. Tucker for being with us here today. And, uh, Following on from Dr. Saha's words, I just wanted to frame this a little bit uh, more broadly about the, within the context of the Australia-India relationship. As many of you would know, less than two weeks ago, despite their hectic schedules and all the turmoil that's going on in the world right now, our two Prime Ministers came together 
to announce the elevation of the Australia-India relationship to that of what is called in government speak as a comprehensive strategic partnership. This is the highest level of partnership that two countries often have. And as part of their deliberations, the strength of our educational ties were acknowledged and highlighted as an important part of our future collaboration. And it is in the spirit of this collaboration that I am really pleased to help launch the first Australia Virtual Masterclass series to be curated and delivered in partnership with an Indian educational agency, the Central Board of Secondary Education. We have done a very successful masterclass series just in the last month, but not one that was curated and put together uh, in collaboration in such a way. So to Dr. Saha, we are truly grateful that the Central Board has joined Austrade in this initiative and honoured that you have entrusted Australian institutions to provide exclusive professional development masterclasses for your school leaders. So to all of your leaders who have taken the time and who are participating today, I thank you so much for making the time to do so. And what better way to start when we are all looking to the future being full of possibilities than to focus on space. It is a highlight in our relationship. India, as we know, has proven science, scientific capability and made remarkable progress in developing its space industry. And it's one of the areas of country, country to country collaboration that Austrade is eager to make happen and deepen. So I too am really looking forward to hearing Dr. Brad Tucker of the Mount Stromlo Observatory, which is part of the very prestigious Australian National University. The six part series for school leaders starts today and will continue to the end of June. There are six, uh, yeah, well, it's six parts, so there's six in the series, uh, but I do encourage you to participate in as many of those as you can. So again, Dr. Saha, thank you and the Central Board of Secondary Education for extending support to our program. And thank you to all of you here on the webinar today for participating. Thank you so much, and I'll hand back to Stuart. Thank you, Catherine. And now I'd like to introduce our guest academic leader and speaker, Dr. Brad Tucker. Brad's an astrophysicist slash cosmologist at the Research School of Astronomy and Astrophysics at Mount Stromlo Observatory and the National Centre of the Public Awareness of Space at the Australian National University, Canberra. Brad is leading programs using NASA's Kepler Space Telescope and TESS, the, tra the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, to understand things like why and how stars blow up. He's also building a network of ultraviolet telescopes in the upper atmosphere as part of a search to find our solar, history, our solar system's mystery planet nine, as well as issues surrounding the mining of asteroids. Brad frequently gives talks to school groups and the public about astronomy and has regular segments on radio and TV stations. He's also had the honour actually of um, developing a series of coins with the Royal Australian Mint. And he's consulted on a number of scientific, uh, science fiction movies and been featured on a number of TV specials. Brad, I remember having National Grid geographic posters of the planets <laughs> and the space shuttle and articles about Skylab crashing into Australia on my bedroom wall in the 70s and 80s. So I'm very much looking forward to this topic, although I do have to admit that now I'm a bit more of a fan of the Star Wars of old rather than being a stargazer nowadays. So, but it may not be too late to change my career. So over to you, Brett. Thank you. Now, thank you very much. Yes, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I hope what we'll talk about today will just show you how we're actually ahead of science fiction and a lot of these things. Um, and you know, thank you for everyone who's joining in. Um, you know, I just like to, to, you know, one of the things that we were just mentioned was you know, the cooperation between Australia and India. Uh, and that extends in a big way to space. And it's one of the big things that is growing. Uh, you know, as India is quickly becoming 
one of the world's biggest players and powers in space with very ambitious and achievable goals. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And Australia is having a, a huge growth in space and astronomy. In fact, we expect that it will be 30,000 jobs in space alone in Australia by 2030. And there's so many things happening. And so when you're talking about students, it's getting also more than than just astronomy and physics. We're going to talk where there's issues with law and medicine and ethics um, and engineering. And there's a huge area that is now undergoing, which is really exciting. And the cool thing, and we'll touch on this a little bit, is for you teachers, ways that you can do very cheap, simple experiments that are cutting edge science. And that's the, the exciting thing of how space is growing. It's becoming so cheap and accessible that you can do it in your classroom and you can access it for your classroom. Um, I'd just like to start off by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands I live. Uh, in Canberra, that is the Ngunnawal and Nambri people. And I acknowledge and celebrate their uh, elders past, present, and emerging. Because when we talk about um, things in Australia and we talk about uh, space, we're talking about really what's happening uh, in space. Uh, we also have to talk about what's happened in the past, how we started off, where we've come from. And in Australia, there's some really unique places that we can look to the history of it. So um, if you've heard of Stonehenge, some of you may have sto heard of Stonehenge, uh, the rock formation in the UK uh, that traces the summer solstice and the summer solstice will happen uh, in about a week on Sunday. Well, Australia has its own Stonehenge. Uh, it's called Wurdi Wang. And Wurdi Wang is this rock formation that you can see uh, in this photo. Uh, and it's in Victoria, so the southern part of Australia. Um, and some astronomers and scientists and anthropologists studied the rock formation. And what they found was that these rocks trace the solstices at summer. So in the middle of summer, we can trace the sunset. In the middle of winter, we can trace the sunset. And it even traces the equinoxes, autumn and spring, perfectly. This, so far, is one of the oldest astronomical and space experiments in the entire world. And we're lucky to have it here in Australia as part of some of the great science that the first Australians have done. Uh, and in fact, this thing is 11,000 years old. It is 5,000 years older than Stonehenge. It's a really remarkable thing. And so there's a whole new area in Australia, what we call Aboriginal astronomy, that's studying. And that is the, the science and research of the first people who lived on this continent, their connection to the sky and what stories we told and what scientific information we've uncovered. It's a really exciting area that's growing. And it's a bit different than you may think about it. And it's a, it's a mixture of skill sets. And there's a lot of work happening in Australia and around the world on these sorts of areas, connecting observations from the past and to the future. In fact, uh, one of my specialties is supernova. So I study stars that explode. So actually, I'll ask, I'll ask you a question. How often do you think stars explode? So how often in the sky do stars explode? Once a year? Once a second? Once a minute? And as you're thinking about that answer, when you think about all the stars that we have in the sky, we have about two trillion galaxies, two trillion things like our Milky Way. And our Milky Way has about 300 billion stars. We think every galaxy has billions and billions of stars. And so some people have said every minute, every few seconds, every moment. Every second, 50 stars explode. Every second in our universe, 50 stars explode. So we've been here for 20 minutes. So we're, there's about 3,000 stars that explode every single minute in the universe. So 60,000 stars have exploded since we started. Think about it. In the time we've been sitting, 60,000 stars have exploded. It's amazing to imagine how many things are happening in space. And yet, the first observation we have of a supernova came from historical records in China in 158 AD. So almost 2,000 years ago, 
the first observation of a supernova, because those historical records, someone made a note of it, and we are able to find it and then go and look for it in space today and see how it's changed. So it's a very interesting, exciting area that's now happening in space. Now, this photo, do you think this photo was taken in space or not? So in the chat box, just type no or yes. Do you think this photo is in space? Yes, you do, or no, you don't? Lots of yeses. Give a second. Lots of yeses, a few noes. So the answer is no, it is not taken in space. It looks like in space, but this is taken on a giant balloon. These balloons we launch go in the air about 40 kilometers in the air. Uh, and this is actually something that here at ANU, we work on with a private company in the US and with our colleagues in India, specifically some of the institutes in Bangalore. Um, we work on launching these high altitude balloons. Um, oh yeah, so some people notice that there's this weird in vertical shape, like the earth is bending backwards. Uh, that's just because we have a, a fisheye lens, so it distorts it. So no, the earth is not that weird. Um, but what you can notice is that you can see the atmosphere. And, and Sajit, we'll talk about the benefits of this in a second and actually how you can do this in the classroom. If you were to imagine the earth as an apple, the skin of the apple would be the atmosphere of our earth. It is very thin. Now, we like to send these things into space. So firstly, um, I'll, I'll say that um, space starts, so this balloon was taken at 40 kilometers. Space starts at 100 kilometers. Do you know why space starts at 100 kilometers? Because we needed a legal definition and we just needed a nice round number. That is literally the choice. It is not the atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere extends for about 2,000 kilometers. It goes for about 2,000 kilometers into the sky. Even the space station and satellites are in a little bit of Earth's atmosphere. We can't use uh, gravity because the gravity goes all the way to the moon. So we said 100 kilometers because we just needed a number we can remember. It is the law boundary of space. And so space law is a really big thing that is undergoing. As we launch things into space, we need a definition to go, look, uh, Daniga, I kind of think it's hilarious too that we just chose a round number, but it works. Because, you know, 99 kilometers, 101 kilometers, it's kind of the same thing. And this number just says we can say we're in space. And it's important from a legal standpoint because as we put things in, we need laws to govern that. And this is a big area that the world, especially, especially here in Australia, in fact, at ANU, we've just started a space law group to focus on these issues. Because what happens when there's an accident? What happens when there's a crash? Um, in fact, it was reported about six months ago, we might have seen the first space crime. Uh, an astronaut on board the space station uh, was reported to have uh, logged into her uh, partner's um, computer and actually committed a cyber crime. So it's a space cyber crime, which is a Bit of an interesting mix there, and was in trouble. But how do we govern the law, though? Because the tricky part is the current law says that whoever put the thing up in space, that's the law that applies. So if I, in Australia, build a satellite, but I take it to a company in New Zealand who builds the rocket, but then we go launch from a third country, let's say French Guiana, now, I only chose that because on Saturday, we launched a satellite on a New Zealand rocket. We build a lot of these satellites here in Canberra. And that rocket launches from French Guiana because French Guiana launches all of Europe's satellites. If that satellite crashes into something, who's at fault? Well, the rules say it's the country that launched it. So French Guiana, like the rule is they who touched it last. It's not a very good rule, but that was the way the law was written 50 years ago. But things have changed. And so when we think about the problems of space, it's all about who controls it. So that astronaut, she was an American astronaut, but on board the International Space Station that's done through an international treaty, launched 
by uh, the Russian space agency on a, from Kazakhstan. So an American astronaut launched on a Russian rocket from Kazakhstan to the International Space Station. That's a really interesting problem that we have. Um, it's a really complicated world that this space law is coming from. Now, if we go back to this photo, this was actually taken from, as I said, a giant balloon. One of the things that we launch uh, these balloons are, these balloons can go in the air for about six months at a time. So they can go into the atmosphere. They go anywhere between 25 and 40 kilometers. They stay in the air for about six months. And we attach telescopes to the bottom. And the reason we do that is because, as we were just showing here, it looks like we're in space, but we're not. We're still in the Earth's atmosphere. So it goes up. The balloon can come back down. After six months land, we can refill it with air. We can launch it into space. So it's a really exciting thing that we can do from the ground. And because it lands, we can refill it and we can relaunch it. It becomes reusable. Now, the reason we do the science of this is one of the big questions we want to ask, or some of the big questions we want to ask, we need lots of telescopes to do it. So, in fact, this is taken uh, last year from flight radar. It tracks airplanes. And you can see where all the little balloons are. Those are our balloons in the sky. And we would put them over Australia. Uh, but these balloons can go anywhere. And by having lots of these balloons with these telescopes on there, we can see specific things. We can see things changing fast and fast. We can see things changing often. Because one of the big questions we want to answer is, with all of these planets that we're finding, because we're finding thousands and thousands of planets. And in fact, uh, before I get into that, one of the cool things you can do is all of these um, uh uh, planets out there, and yes, I'll, I'll mention um, about the colors in a second. All of these planets that we find, you can actually look at the data yourself. If you go to the Kepler, uh, if you search for the Kepler Space Telescope, a project I've worked on, or TESS, the new space telescope, all of their data is public. So you can actually, with your students, go look at some of the candidate new planets. And if you have access to a small telescope or robotic telescope, you can follow up and actually confirm and find new planets using the data from these NASA satellites. It's all completely public and school students do this. We have a big project here in Australia uh, that we at the ANU are working with the, the Australian science teachers to actually have uh, students follow up exoplanet, as we call it, candidates, to try and find their own new planets. And you can do this for primary age students, for students age 10, even younger. It's a really cool thing. But one of the big questions that remains is we find these planets, but are they like Earth? That's one of the big goals. Can we find um, planets like Earth? Now, mostly when we find these planets, we know that they, how close they are to their star. So this planet, so this is Earth on the left, this planet is orbits 385 days, so a bit further out but pretty close to our Earth. The planet is 1.6 times the size of our Earth. Um, and it's also a, around a sun that is similar to our sun. So that means the temperature is about the same. But the big question is, does it have an atmosphere? Does it have air? Can something breathe on it? And this is one of the big questions we want to ask. So we look in a very specific color of light called ultraviolet light. Now, what we can do with this is we can look at what we call Rayleigh scattering. So it's a really cool principle in physics that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, you physics teachers. And that is as light goes to the atmosphere here on Earth, the red light, so if we take here on Earth, the red light scatters away, it refracts off, the blue light passes through and we have a blue sky. And that's because of the composition of our atmosphere. Well, if we monitor other planets and we look at the quality of the light and how much light is coming through the atmosphere, we can see what colors pass through or not. And that gives us clues to the atmosphere. So a great example is Mars. This is something you can do with your students even. On Mars, look at what it's like on daytime and sunrise and sunset. So on Earth, we have blue sky. 
And at night or sunset and sunrise, the sky becomes orangey, pinky red, right? And that's because the density and the composition of our atmosphere means that the less red light scatters away, we get that red light traveling through our atmosphere and we see it. On Mars, the daytime is red. So Mars's atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide. Um, we can see that during the daytime, the atmosphere is red. At nighttime, sunrise and sunset, Mars is blue. So Mars has blue sunrises and sunsets, all because of the atmosphere. And this is the cool thing. We can see now this technique around other planets. So if we see certain colors of light, we can see what kind of atmosphere is there. If there's no change, no atmosphere, we can even detect clouds in these planets by seeing how the colors of light change over time. The other thing we like to do with this, and this is the big area I want to do, is unfortunately we can't see it, the video's not working, sorry, but we can see the shock waves leave stars, and we can see black holes colliding, what we call gravitational waves. We can see these extreme events in space, things that explode and things that collide, some of these most massive things just by looking in the ultraviolet light. Now, the great thing about ultraviolet light is some of the ultraviolet light gets into the Earth's atmosphere, right? We get radio waves that get to the ground, so there's radio dishes. Um, the GMRT, which is a big radio dish in, in India, is one that um, a lot of Australian scientists use. Likewise, Australia has lots of radio dishes. Now, the ultraviolet light is blocked by the ozone. So if you can get above the ozone, you can see ultraviolet light. And in fact, here, this is a really cool thing that we were able to measure. So here's latitude on the bottom. So here's the equator. I'm in Canberra, which is at minus 33 latitude. So we're about here. We can see to the South Pole and to the North Pole. And this is taken in January, April, July, and October. And here's the height. So you can see here that the atmosphere, the ozone varies from 10 kilometers to about 30 kilometers. And you notice it's really peaky really high around the equator. That's where most of the ozone is made and mixed, and it goes slowly down to the poles. One of the things that we were able to pick up, do you see this hole in the ozone? It's not there in January, not really there in April, but we're starting to see it in October. That is the hole in the ozone layer. People talk about the hole in the ozone layer. We can see it because we can see not only the amount of ozone, but how the ultraviolet light is coming through. But if we fly at 30 or 40 kilometers, we're above the ozone, so we can see ultraviolet light, and we can do these really exciting space things. And this data, some of these measurements, was taken with this. So this is actually something that we just 3D printed. So some of you, if you have access to 3D printers, you can 3D print a little spectrograph or a camera, you put a little slit light so you can see we have the torch going through and we can see the rainbow colors so we can measure the different colors of light. And so I just want to quickly talk about how what you can potentially do with your school students. So one of the other ways you can do this is by what we call short duration balloons. So instead of a big balloon that goes up for six months, you can buy these weather balloons. And they're essentially latex, so you can see here. Now all these balloons are filled with helium. So the helium uh, is what gives it lift. So those big balloons use mostly helium. Um, these little ones, you just need a small tank of helium like you put in party balloons. And it's not too heavy to lift me, but, you know, if I was smaller, it could carry me. And uh, what you simply have is a balloon, a parachute. And at the bottom of that parachute, you have whatever it is you want to do your experiment. Now, you can put something using a couple hundred Australian dollars um, worth of material, the balloon, the gas, and the equipment. You can put your own experiment up high in the atmosphere. Um, in fact, you can see the balloon here. Um, so you can see how big it kind of looks to the people um, before takeoff. Now, it only goes up for about three hours, but hopefully, depending on where you are, it doesn't go very far, it may just do a loop, so it may only vary by about 20 kilometers, it may go further because of winds. So you wanna recover it. Obviously, if your balloon goes up, you wanna be able to find it and bring it back to do your experiment. But some of these experiments can be really small. In fact, 
um, when we have the recording, you have the slides. This is literally all the equipment you need. Some sort of helium tank, a balloon, string, maybe some sort of ins insulation, some tape and gloves, and some sort of tracker or receiver. And you can put, you know, a phone camera or a GoPro even on it. Uh, CASA is the Australian space uh, regulator, so you need someone to be able to tell you where it is. And a radar reflector. Literally, this could just be a piece of aluminum foil so that when planes send their radar, it bounces off and you can detect it. This all could be done for a couple hundred bucks. And you can send any sort of experiment what you can do. Because one of the cool things about going this high is you're a lot like Mars. So here is what the conditions of Earth are like at 30 kilometers where these balloons can go. And this is what it's like on Mars. The atmospheric pressure is the same. The temperature is the same. Now, the gravity is different. We can't change that much, too much. The magnetic field is a bit similar now. The intensity in the ultraviolet light, the radiation. So if you want to figure out what it would be like to grow vegetables on Mars, set it up to, the, set it up to near space, and you can do that. In fact, this was an experiment done by um, five-year-olds. They wanted to see how candy lollies would change in space. So here's it just above the ground. Here's it in space. You can see some marshmallows, and they're able to see how the marshmallows expanded. A very simple thing that you can do. And because you can carry about four kilograms, we can, you can actually launch about eight experiments at a time if they're super lightweight. It doesn't need to be fancy. As you see here, these are just plastic containers with some string and tape. It's really simple to do. Um, so as long as you can go under about four kilograms, you can do these sorts of things. Now, for the big balloons that I launch, our telescope is 20 kilograms. So the kind of the amazing thing is our whole telescope has to be 20 kilograms, which has to be very lightweight and effective, but we can do it. But we've had students who have launched seeds. So they kept some seeds on Earth, they launched some seeds into space, and then they were able to grow the two different sets of seeds and see how they change with time, how seeds in a Mars-like environment can change and grow differently than an Earth-like environment. And there's a number of experiments that you can look up. So there's a lot of them online. And in fact, I'm sure I can find a way to share some of the list of ideas that we've had. You can change anywhere from testing radiation to um, simple things like candy. So it can be from young students to high school students. You can build your own uh, you know, programmable board. You can measure the weather and temperature, and then you can build a camera, and you can measure things in space, all for a couple hundred dollars. And as long as the flight restrictions allow you to wherever you are, usually you can, you can do this with your students. And so it's a really amazing thing um, that you can do. Now, great question, can these balloons be controlled? So these three-hour balloons that I've been talking about, you can't really control them. They just go up, and that's that. The balloons I launched, the big, big ones, we can control them. So, in fact, they stay in the same 20-kilometer spot. They just go up there, rotate, and come back down. Because one of the other things that we're now doing is we're looking at putting infrared cameras on these balloons and looking downward, not to spy on people, but we want to help measure the effects of bushfires and monitor bushfires from around. So we can see as bushfires are growing pretty quickly, and we can look at a few other things. So there's a really great area that you can do with your students, and there's lots of great scientists in India that, as I said, that we work with who do a lot of these high altitude balloons. And in fact, there's some of the same people who are planning and landing things on the moon, as I'll talk about in a second. Because one of the ways that we go next is once we go above the Earth, the next step is the moon. There is a lot of work right now in going back to an interest of going to the moon. Now, Australia is part of a U.S.-led program called Artemis. So Artemis is this um, return to the moon mission to land astronauts on the moon, hope, hopefully by 2024, if not a little bit later. Now, one of the big cool things is that we are building a space station around the moon. So right now, there's a space station uh, that's in orbit around the Earth. It has five astronauts currently, and it goes around the Earth every 92 minutes. The goal here is to build a space station around the moon, and bits of it are already being built. 
in the U.S., Australia, and overseas, other places overseas. And it could house, hopefully, four astronauts at a time for about three months. Now, one of the things that um, we're focusing on is, firstly, we did land on the moon. It's almost been 51 years since humans first landed on the moon. And I, and I like this because this is something you could actually do at school. If you, can build, if you have access to a big enough laser, and you can buy them for probably about 200 Australian dollars, the Apollo missions and other missions left these little metal reflector plates on the moon. So these aren't very big. They're about the size of a table. And lasers were built, so we maintain a laser system here in Canberra. There's also one in Western Australia. Uh, and there's a few in India and, and all over the world. And these lasers fire at the metal reflector plates and the light comes back down to Earth. Now, because we know the speed of light, we can time it and we can actually figure out the distance to the moon. We know the distance to the moon within one millimeter. We have one millimeter accuracy to the moon. And we now know the moon is drifting away 3.8 centimeters per year. So about every year, the moon is four centimeters further. So over time, this actually changes the tides. As the moon drifts away, the tides weaken. And also as the moon drifts away, our daytime slows down. So every, every 5,000 years, we get an extra second. So literally, every year is slightly longer than the previous year. Not that you can really measure it. It may seem longer, especially 2020, but there is a physical reason. But the cool thing is, if we work backwards, that means that around the time of the dinosaurs, and this has been measured, the day was only 23 and a half hours long. So even measuring the drifting of the planet, and if you have an accurate, if you have a big enough laser and you can buy these and you can get these, and you can put in the coordinates and aim it at uh, this, and you have a little telescope to receive it, you can detect the light coming back down off these plates, and you can measure not the distance to the moon, with millimeter precision and over time, potentially even measure the drifting of the moon. So it's all readily available. Now, the other important thing here is this little pole here. Now, it looks like a radar antenna or a, a thermometer. It's actually a seismometer. It measures quakes. Now, they're not earthquakes because it's not the earth. We call them moonquakes. The moon has moonquakes. And what's happening is, so the Earth and the Moon tug on each other. As the Moon tugs on the Earth, we get tides. As the Earth tugs on the Moon, we're causing the surface of the Moon to shrivel, to shrink upon itself. And this is causing um, the Moon to almost implode. And you can actually look on the NASA websites. It, they're just called Moon Seismometers. So if you look for Moon Seismometers, you'll be able to see uh, the instruments. And you can see the actual logs and records of it. And you can do this on Mars as well. And you can see the real-time effects. And this tells us a lot about how the geology and environmental conditions of the moon are changing. It's a really interesting experiment that was done because people landed on the moon. But one of the reasons we're really interested in going back to the moon was actually a discovery by India. The Chandrayaan-1 mission launched about, I think, 11 years ago now was the first mission to, to really pinpoint that the moon had a lot of water ice. Now, when we say ice, we mean H2O, the stuff that we can drink. And there is a lot of it on the moon. And the reason there is this interest in getting back to the moon is because we think the moon is a very easy place to build and launch from. So one of the things um, is that well, I'll ask you, why are rockets so big, right? We see these rockets, they're huge. Why? Well, fuel, right? Rockets need lots of fuel so they can escape Earth's gravity and go into space. But what happens as we add more fuel? You add more weight. So you add more fuel, so you add more weight. And in fact, you can actually have your students do this calculation. How quickly do you lose energy by adding fuel? Because there is a limit to how big you and how much fuel you can add. Because as you add more fuel, you're adding more weight, so it's not as efficient. 
But what does the moon not have a lot of? Gravity also has very little atmosphere. So if you can land on the moon, you can refuel and take off further into space. And what can we use as fuel? Ice. So water is hydrogen and oxygen. Break that up, you get hydrogen and oxygen. That is the same ingredients as rocket fuel. You can convert ice into rocket fuel. In fact, there's a, two, there's a bunch of groups. There's a company in the Gold Coast in Queensland doing this. There's some researchers at ANU who are perfecting this technology into new types of rocket engines. And we think this will be a much more efficient way of going further into space. And there has been a lot of work of going back to the moon. So just to put this in the scale, all the way until 2019, only two countries have ever landed on the moon, the US and Russia. 2019, last year alone, three countries landed on the moon. China in January landed on the far side of the moon. Now, firstly, there isn't a dark side of the moon, right? There's a far side of the moon. So there's a side that we can see that sometimes has light and sometimes has darkness. But the far side sometimes has sunlight. And this mission that China landed, this rover, had a really interesting, important thing. And that is it had a biosphere. It had a little greenhouse. So in the greenhouse, they had silkworms, potato seeds, and cotton seeds. So as the silkworms breathe, they breathe out carbon dioxide. Plants breathe in carbon dioxide, breathe out oxygen. So on, so on. They created a living environment on the far side of the moon. And in fact, you can see here, these plants sprouted and grew. Um, and so they were able to show that you can have things live and survive on the far side of the moon. So it's a really remarkable thing that they're able to do to show that as we go to the moon, we can potentially go further and do more things in space. Now, in April, Israel tried to land on the moon, but they had what's called a hard landing, which is a fancy term for crash. Uh, and in September, uh, India did uh, the Chandrayaan-2 mission. So there's an orbiter, and that orbiter um, is still around the moon. And they had the lander, and out of the lander came the rover. Now, the lander landed a bit too hard, unfortunately. Um, so the rover wasn't able to come out, but it was fairly successful. What amazes me about this mission is how much it cost. Now, it cost $100 million Australian dollars. And that's a lot of money. But if you, if you ever saw the movie Gravity, I don't know, maybe some of you heard of it. It was a movie five, six years ago with Sandra Bullock, and it was about space junk. That movie cost 120 million Australian dollars. It is now cheaper to go to the moon than it is to make a movie about going into space. India did that. India showed you can make it cheaply to go into space. And it's a remarkable idea now that space is so cheap and accessible that we can do things and we can live broadcast the images and the data and see it. In fact, you can actually go, um, so if you search for, if you know Google Earth, Google Earth now has Google Moon. Just search for Google Moon and you can explore the surface of the moon with your students. You can see the Apollo landing sites. You can see the topology and landing. Of, yeah, I would be proud of ISRO too. I, we all are. Um, it was a remarkable thing what they pulled off. The Indian Space Agency is really showing what you can do in space. And um, so you can see all of this data being gathered by the different moon missions, and you can see it live with your students. So just go to Google Moon, and it's kind of a really cool addictive thing, I think. And we all, we all want to go to the moon because people want to go to Mars. There is a lot of talk about going to Mars. Now, it's not going to be easy. There is a, a lot of work needed for humans to go to the moon, or go to Mars, rather. And um, yes, yeah, so yeah, it, it's you just do Google Moon. I think it's google.com slash moon. But if you search for Google Moon, um, we can do it. Now, lots of people are optimistic about going to the Mars. I'm not. I think humans will go to Mars at some point, but it won't be soon. And it's not the technology. It's the human aspect. It's the humans needing to go to the moon and Mars. And um, one of the things to think about is, A, how long does it take to get to Mars? 
It takes the quickest we can make a trip just to Mars is seven months. So that's seven months stuck inside a rocket. And the rockets aren't going to be very big. You know, you may get in something the size of a car with a few people. You may be in a house, maybe with, or the size of a small room with six to 10 people. You may be in a house, but you have to squeeze a hundred people in there. It is going to be a tiny thing and you're stuck in there for seven months. And then you land on Mars and you're on Mars. The quickest we can make a trip to Mars staying there and coming back is three years. It is a long time. And even when you land on Mars, it is so far away, it takes 25 minutes for a signal to reach Earth. So imagine trying to do anything remotely. You have a 50 minute delay. It's a 50 minute delay just to talk to Mars and have that signal come back to Earth. It makes it very impractical. Now, lots of people do wanna build Mars colonies as you're seeing here. There's a lot of issues with that though, not just ethically and legally, but just technologically. Now, the atmosphere of Mars, as I said early, earlier, is 95% carbon dioxide. Now, you may think, can't we grow plants there? And that converts into oxygen. The problem is Mars's atmosphere is very weak. So Mars's atmosphere is about a sixth the atmosphere of Earth. Now, that changes temperature. So, so just as we looked with the balloons, as you go into the Earth's atmosphere, it gets a lot colder. That's the same thing on Mars. So Mars has very extremes. So in fact, if you're standing on the ground of Mars, it could be 20 degrees at your feet and zero degrees at your head. You can literally go from freezing or from comfortable to freezing in the span of your body. It's a kind of crazy, remarkable idea of how extreme temperatures you can get on Mars. And when we look at Mars, it's very dry. It looks a lot like parts of Australia, unfortunately. But there's important things that we can see. We can see the mountains and, and ridges. But if we look in the middle of this photo, we see those cracks. We can see evidence of water, rivers, and lakes on the surface of Mars. And next month, a number of rovers, so on July 17th, a number of rovers will be um, sent to Mars and they will look and explore the surface. They will try and see, is there anything living on Mars? And when we talk about living, let's be clear here. We're not talking about aliens or Goya or weird things. We're talking about bacteria, microbes. And the question is, did or does Mars have life? And this will be something that we hope can be answered because we see water was on the surface of Mars. Now, water is not there now, but there is water underneath the surface of Mars. If you look one and a half kilometers deep, there are oceans, saltwater oceans, but there are oceans, lakes of water underneath the ground of Mars. And again, just for all of those reasons that we talked about earlier from the moon, same thing applies to Mars. Can we use that for rocket fuel? Now we can convert that seawater, that salt water, into normal water and use it for rocket fuel. We don't do that on Earth because it is very inefficient, but it may be the best way of doing it on the moon or Mars. But also, um, could we or could anything else survive down there? Um, someone just asked uh, about the tardigrades. This is a great example. If you don't know what the tardigrades are, uh, the tardigrades are what we call water bears. These are uh, an extremophile. They're a type of extreme life. It's a great thing to look at um, with um, maybe uh, some of your uh, students, how extreme conditions have tardigrades, and these are life forms, survived here on Earth. They've been frozen, they've been heated up, they've put, put in the vacuum of space. They have just survived that. So we think tardigrades could survive on the moon or Mars. And there may be other types of life forms that we haven't detected. So, you know, the answer to, is there life somewhere else in the universe? We may have a lot of those answers um, in a few years time. Some of these big questions we may have the answers to in a few years time. Now, Mars is also quite interesting. And that is that it has giant volcanoes. This is Olympus Mons. It is the biggest volcano in the solar system. It is literally 500 kilometers across. 
It is. It would take you hours to drive around it. It is so big, it sticks out of the atmosphere. It is three, three and a half times bigger than Mount Everest. It is gigantic. Now, it's dormant. It's not active. But this leads to an interesting problem of Mars. Mars, just like the moon, has moon quake, as quakes. Mars has Mars quakes. In fact, if you go to YouTube, search, if you go on YouTube and search for the NASA JPL website, NASA JPL, and search for Mars quakes, you can hear some of the Mars quakes that have been detected on there. There have been over 300 quakes on Mars detected since the probe landed there a year and a half ago. The problem with Mars quakes is they're really violent. They're actually more violent and last longer than earthquakes. So how do you build something on Mars when the quakes are worse? You don't want to land on Mars and land on a fault line or where there's lots of quakes. So, you know, Mars becomes very interesting in terms of uh, the, the challenges it poses. Now, a few people have asked this. Um, one of the things that we have to do to do this is we need to be able to extract things in space. Now, we talked about digging water and ice out. How do we mine in space? And this is something that Australia is working on with the Japanese Space Agency. Um, and we worked on what's called Hayabusa 2. And Hayabusa 2 is a Japanese mission with Australia that landed on this asteroid. It landed on the asteroid Rigu um, October 2018. Now, asteroids are just giant chunks of metal. Literally, asteroids have ice and metal. That's about it. And what we did was three times last year, the probe went down to the surface. It dug down. It scooped everything up and popped out. In between the second and third time, we detonated a capsule that contained 10 kilograms of C4, and we blew a hole in the asteroid. Not just to see why, but uh, we wanted to create a new crater to see what's underneath the ground. And the reason we were looking at this was to see what kind of min minerals it has. What is it made up of? Because asteroids have lots of metal. In fact, you can get literally a hundred years worth of nickel from one single asteroid. So think of how we use lithium, lithium and nickel. We use it in batteries, renewable batteries and storage. We can potentially get so much of this from one single asteroid that we can make battery storage so cheap that we can completely shift to renewable energy and storage overnight or once it's done. There's lots of gold. There's lots of metals on these things. It is amazing how rich these bodies are. And so one of the goals is can we dig? Can we extract them in space? So this probe not only has done it, but it's actually returning to Earth. Hayabusa is going to land in South Australia in December. So we are able already to land on things, dig and extract them, and return them to Earth. Now there's lots of issues involved, not just technical as well. There's lots of legal issues. How do we prevent Piracy, space pirates, it sounds very far-fetched, but how do you prevent people from stealing it? How do we make sure it's legal and ethical? How do we make sure that no one country benefits it? How do we deal with private companies? So again, space law is this thing that's becoming a bigger and bigger area that we need to get a handle on that we don't really know where it's going to lead or what's going to happen to it. Now, let's take a step back from our solar system, though. This is our universe. Now, this isn't a, a real picture of our universe. Um, this is kind of a, a graphical representation. Now, our universe is 93 billion light years. It takes like 93 billion light years to get from the side. Or our universe is 13.8 billion years old. But when we talk about the universe and we talk about the Big Bang, what do we actually mean? So when we say the Big Bang began the universe, what did it begin? Well, it actually began space-time. Oops, sorry. Go back. It began space-time. And I'll talk about that in a second because it's actually the idea that you can time travel and you can travel through space differently. And one of the ways we see this interacting is when we travel to Mars. This is from the movie The Martian, Matt Damon. 
So, you know, ignore him. I don't know why we keep rescuing Matt Damon in space, but we do. But NASA has actually been interested in how humans survive health problems in space. When you're in space, there's very little pressure, there's very little gravity, there's the temperature extremes. So actually, here's a great question to talk about with your students. Is space cold or hot? Is it cold or is it hot? Well, it turns out space is both. As you orbit the Earth every 90 minutes, when you're away from the sun, it's minus 150 degrees Celsius. When you go around the sun 45 minutes later, around the Earth into the sun, it's 150 degrees Celsius. So space is both. That's right. It is cold and hot. The human body has to go through a lot of different problems in space. Um, here's, a great, here's a great trivia question, and you can talk about this. Lots of animals have been into space. Does anyone know what animal has been the most in space? Type it in the chat box. I'm, I'm curious. What animal has been the most in space? Nope, it's not dog. The Russians love sending dogs, but it's not dogs. Not monkeys, there's been quite a few. Not mice, cows. Cows would be very expensive. No one's guessed it. Cockroaches, that would be interesting. I'd like to send a kangaroo into space. The French did send cats. I'll give you the answer. Um, there have been two tortoises. Two tortoises have been to the moon, actually. They were the, the first things. Jellyfish. There have been 60,000 jellyfish in space. Now, obviously, you're wondering why. Um, now, NASA bred jellyfish because, A, when jellyfish go up, they reproduce. They reproduce quickly. They reproduce a lot. But more importantly, when they reproduce, when the baby jellyfish are born, crystals form in the base of their bodies. And this acts as buoyancy, tells them how to swim. So NASA bred generations and generations and generations of jellyfish, and they brought those baby jellyfish back down to Earth, and they couldn't swim. Literally, the jellyfish formed differently in space because they were in space. In fact, astronauts have a huge amount of problems. Um, astronauts actually develop clots in their neck. So if you ever have a, what we call DVT, um, it's uh, you get clotting in your legs if you sit for too long. Astronauts get that in their brains. Uh, your eye changes in space. Fluids move differently in space. Your eye literally changes. You cannot see the same in space. When you come back down, astronauts have vision problems. They need glasses. They sometimes can't even see right for about um, months. Uh, you can't stand properly. In fact, um, there's so much blood differently going to your brain, when you come back down to Earth, you feel lightheaded and you faint. So there's lots of health problems going into space. Uh, and in fact, one of the simple ones is radiation, right? Once you get away um, around from the Earth, away from our magnetic bubble, you get bombarded with lots of radiation. That's a big problem. In fact, 2015, NASA and Russia each sent an astronaut into space. Uh, now, they were chosen because a, they would go into space for a year. Most astronauts only go for three to six months. But Scott Kelly was chosen because he's an identical twin. So the question was, would the twin who's been in space for a year have anything different than the twin who was on the ground? And the answer is yes. They literally are different. The identical twin, Scott, who was in space for a year, came back different compared to his identical twin who didn't. There's a lot of different things that are happening and changing to the human body that we don't really understand. The human body goes through a lot of things. There's also just psychological effects. You're gonna be stuck in a, uh, an area. So in fact, in Europe sends their astronauts into caves because you're in a very confined area, you're isolated, extreme conditions. How can you survive that place? How can you survive being away from your family and friends? And you have to be stuck with someone. Right? You're going to be stuck with other people. How are you going to survive that? How are you going to work as a team? All of these sorts of things are really big and a really big challenge when you're talking about going into space. Now, going back to our universe. One of the reasons I'd like to bring up those twins was when those twins, so this is a great question, did they become younger? So 
There's a thing called telomeres. These are coatings around your chromosomes. The identical twin, when he came back down from space, was a little bit younger than his twin was on the ground. And that's because time travel is possible. If you can travel in space, you can travel in time. The time dimension works exactly the same as the space dimension. So uh, here's a good example. If you're to be on a rocket at 80% the speed of light for two years, so say, let's say you go on a rocket for 80% the speed of light and you go into space for two years. You come back down, how much do you age? You age two years. How much, how much did everyone age on the ground? They aged five years. And in fact, one of the things that NASA's done is they've sent an atomic clock into space. So atomic clock is the exact way we measure time. The clock went into space. They were able to measure the time when it came back down to Earth. It was a different time than the time on the ground. We've been literally able to measure time differences. GPS satellites move so fast that they're in a different frame of time. And if we don't correct for that, our GPS satellites are inaccurate. So um, a great question is related. So can we say that gravity bends time as well? Yes. As you go closer to a gravity or a pocket of gravity, time changes as well. So people always wonder what happens in a black hole. Well, firstly, as you go on a black hole, you die, unfortunately. So don't do that. That's my professional opinion. But the technical term is called spaghettification. You get pulled into a giant piece of spaghetti. But once you reach the boundary of a black hole, time cannot escape. Light cannot escape. And in fact, as you're happening, if you are to be on the boundary of a black hole and look outward, you would see the entire universe evolving for 100 billion years. You would literally see the um, sun grow and destroy the earth and die. You would see galaxies collide. You would see stars explode. You would see the universe change for 100 billion years. But for us on the outside, as we look at you, you would appear frozen in time. You'd be moving so slowly, we don't see any change. So it appears as almost as a frozen piece of spaghetti in space. Now, I'd like to show this table because we like to think about what's in space. Now, this is the periodic table of elements. So, you know, I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. This is not the full periodic table of elements. This is the full periodic table of elements. Each line here is the individual square on the previous table. And that's because elements can mutate, right? We can change the amount of neutrons and protons in it. We can create these things called you know, isotopes. And when we look at actually what's in the universe, the ordinary matter, the stuff that we can tangibly fit in, and deal with, makes up only 5% of everything in the universe. And in fact, one of my favorite things to always talk about is antimatter. So let's take helium, for example. So helium has an electron, and it's made up of two protons, or a nucleus with two protons and two neutrons and two electrons. But those are made up of smaller things, what we call quarks. But what about Newton's law? For every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. The opposite of an electron is not a proton. They have opposite charge, but they don't have opposite mass. So if things have to be balanced, we must have an electron that has the exact opposite in terms of energy or mass, but the same charge. We call that the positron. So the opposite of an electron is a positron. The opposite of a proton is the antiproton. The opposite of a neutron is the antineutron. We use all of our creativity with the positron idea. Apologize for that one. Um, antimatter is real. Antimatter actually is real. Anything that is radioactive produces a little bit of antimatter. Bananas produce a lot of antimatter. Now, antimatter can be measured. We can figure it out. We can calculate it. We can see it. So this poses a problem. Where is the antimatter? If we know matter exists and we know antimatter exists, but we have not enough antimatter, how do we know that? Well, the answer is, if we should have equal amounts of matter and antimatter, they should balance out and we could equal zero. So because we are here, we know we don't have enough antimatter. So the question is, where is it? One of the big things we're working on here is we're trying to find where antimatter is. 
a crazy idea is there may be an entire antimatter universe out there. So this universe has all antimatter, but because we have a bit of antimatter in our universe, they must have a bit of antimatter in their universe, which is our matter. So it makes it really confusing. It's really interesting. And this is a really real thing we have to work on. How does matter and antimatter change in space? And when we still look at the table of elements or the table what's mixed with the universe, most of it is not even that. Most of it is dark matter and dark energy. And I'll just touch on it real quick, and then we'll do questions. I know we're, we're getting close to time. When we think of, of what's in the universe, it's a small percentage. Now, dark matter we know is, is a real thing. Dark matter is uh, a real thing that we can measure in the mass of galaxies. So when we measure how galaxies spin, we see there's missing mass. In fact, one of the people that discovered dark matter was Ken Freeman, who works uh, here at Mount Stromo at ANU. And it's been a big problem. What is this dark matter? We can measure its effects, but we can't see it. One idea is that's what we call a WIMP, a weakly interacting massive particle. So think of something small like a proton or a neutron. It's a new type of that thing. The other thing that we have in the universe is called dark energy. Now, energy, dark energy and dark matter are not related. It's not like E equals MC squared. It's just we're not creative with naming things. I apologize. Um, one of the things with dark energy, though, is it's been recent. It was discovered about 20 years ago, and it's causing our universe to accelerate. Um, one of the, the leaders of the group who discovered dark energy is Brian Schmidt, who was my PhD supervisor and is now uh, head of the university here in Canberra, the ANU. And dark energy is causing our universe to grow faster and faster. We don't know what it is. One of the things I'm leading is trying to figure this out. What is this dark energy? But it's amazing to think that when we think of everything in the universe, all of the stuff that we can study and grasp here on Earth makes up 5% of everything. That there's a lot more in the universe than we're just now uncovering. What I might do is I might stop there and we can do some questions. Brad, um, it's Stuart Reese here. Thank you very much. What an interesting topic. I mean, can you just keep talking until we, you know, you tell us what the meaning of life and everything <laughs> is, please. It'll cost you $20. Um, look, <laughs> yes. There, um, Niha, is, has been compiling some questions and of course we'll ask you those in a moment but I just thought I might lead off with one on something that you said which struck me as being very interesting and I don't know why but you said um, when talking about antimatter that bananas produce a lot of antimatter and I was going to say how do you know that and how do you measure it? So great question. Things that are radioactive produce antimatter. It's one of the reactions that happen. And what we can trace is how the we can kind of do like an inventory. So the great way of thinking about a lot of these things is it's not like a car crash. We see a crash and we go and we see all the different parts and where they fit in. And we keep finding parts that are extra, parts that didn't belong. And we can measure the properties of this thing. So antimatter interacts with gravity. Uh, it interacts with all sorts of things. Um, it just has like negative energy. So it requires a lot of energy to create it, but we can measure it when it happens. And so people have devised ways of seeing the, the reaction uh, in bananas and measured antimatter. So at home, it's probably a bit harder to measure the antimatter itself, but you can actually use a Geiger counter and point it at a banana and actually detect the radioactivity of the banana. It's very small radiation, don't worry. Uh, and then you can actually have your students calculate backwards uh, how much, um, how many particles of antimatter were created? Well, goodness me, I didn't understand that at all. But I'm sure some of the um, teachers and students on this uh, on this uh, webinar will. Um, before I hand over to Neha, I will just mention one thing: is that perhaps we should invite you to India when everybody is able to travel again, and you can perhaps deliver a guest lecture on space and all things around it at uh, one of 
India's really historical astronomical sites, like the Janta Manta uh, in Jaipur in Rajasthan, which yep. was built well before Australia was settled. In you know, in 1735, I think it was uh, construction was completed. Um, Brad, that's uh, enough from me. But Neha, can I pass to you now, and you can begin asking Brad some of the interesting questions that have no, no doubt been posed to you. Thank you. I, yes, I've seen a lot of great questions. I know we're not yeah. going to get to all of them. I apologize. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Brad, for such a wonderful session. It was so fascinating to hear about space lasers, reusable rockets, and space mining. Thank you for sharing experiments, activities, and resources that educators can use with their students. I'm actually overwhelmed with uh, a lot of questions that we're getting from the audience. Um, in order to ask a question, uh, we request you to simply type your question in the chat window on the right side of the panel. Uh, please feel free to go ahead and type a question and we will respond. In the interest of time, uh, we'll try to cover as much as we can. Um, so the first one for you, Brad, um, this is from the educator asking, how can they incul inculcate all these interesting things in the classroom as a teacher? and how uh, to get this space science implemented in classrooms with limited resources available? So that is a great question. Um, one of the things I always think I like touching on is how relevant space science is in other things. You know, uh, chemistry, right? A lot of what we do in space measuring the properties of stars and galaxies is chemistry related. Um, measuring properties of physics um, relating to how things move. One of the great things I always like to point to is if you go there, NASA maintains an entire education website where you can see um, different ideas for in-classroom activities. And at the end of my slides, because um, I didn't get to it, but we actually included a way where people can make their own what's called pinhole cameras. So you can create your own camera um, using just a box and some sticky tape. Uh, and you can measure the diameter of the sun and the moon. So you can do some fundamental measurements yourself. So when we have the recording with the slides, people can uh, see that for themselves. Um, the other thing that we do here uh, at ANU is if you search for um, the Mount Stromlo website, is we have lots of recordings and videos and talks and lectures by our astronomers where they can interact with, including we have a whole demo. We have a whole activity listed, and I can't even do it justice, um, where you can actually create your own hydrogen fuel cell. So that idea we are talking about uh, with how to use hydrogen and water to use it to turn into rocket fuel, you can do that in your classroom, literally using stuff from lying around. Um, the other place I'd like to point people to um, with limited resources that, again, designed to do it is Questacon. Questacon is Australia's National Science Technology Museum. They have lots of online ideas for uh, how you can do this in your own classroom. Um, again, with limited resources. So I think the, the great thing to touch on is how can you um, find ways of teaching fundamental areas of chemistry and physics and earth science all by highlighting in space. And those would be places that I'd point to people to look at. Thank you. That was helpful. Uh, just following up on that question, uh, some of the educators are interested to know specific activities that they can create at middle school level about protons and electrons. There are videos that they're showing to students, but students face difficulty in understanding the concept of electrons. Are there any tips that you have for them? So that is a, that's a very good question. Um, I actually always like to talk about magnets. And one of the reasons I always like to talk magnets is people and students understand magnets and how they work. One of the things that you get to see uh, is um, obviously you could talk about how the magnetic force changes with distance and electrons. One of the great things you can do is you can, if you can take some iron, some iron shaving, so you know maybe find a little block of iron or something that has iron and shave a little piece of it, what we call iron filings. If you apply a magnet to iron filings, because of the electrons in iron, you can actually create patterns and ripples. You can see literally lines of magnetism traveling through it. And then you can show in first hand how it works with electrons, and this actually creates and interacts this negative and positive charge um, with magnetism. The other thing is I always like to do scales. It's really hard to imagine small scale, so make it bigger. We have this exact problem in the solar system. How can you imagine how far away things are? Well, shrink it. 
So for a solar system, one of the great things you could do to create your own solar system with students is you take all the planets and sizes, and then you say, all right, now the sun is a soccer ball or a basketball. And then you, ha you can work with your students to calculate how far away the Earth is. So when the sun's a soccer ball, the Earth is 24 meters away. When the sun is a soccer ball, Pluto's a kilometer away. And you can do that same scale just for electrons. So instead of going small, go big, and you can see how close and tightly packed they are. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question, set of questions are related to the presentation. Um, is it possible that the matter universe and antimatter universe simultaneously exist at the same time without interacting with each other? Yes, we think this is completely possible, and it's really crazy. Um, <laughs> we, we don't know if the antimatter universe exists. We just know there's antimatter somewhere. Uh, and it means that they would sit alongside each other, but they, they, again, as you said, they don't interact because if they interacted, things would be annihilated and destroyed. And we don't see that happening. It's a really big question in astrophysics right now. Okay, great. Fantastic. Um, next one, uh, is it possible to time travel in wormhole? What is the difference between wormhole and a black hole? Aha, great question. So firstly, a, a black hole is an area where a star has died and it's pulled and collapsed everything in into a central point. Now black holes get bigger as black holes collide. So we get black holes that range anywhere from four times the mass of our sun to four billion times the mass of our sun. Now, what happens inside a black hole, we don't know. One of the ideas is what we call a wormhole. So a wormhole is that if there is um, like a connection or a tunnel through space. So imagine if you go into a wormhole or a black hole, we don't know where it goes, but it's actually kind of a, a shortcut through space. So it's like a tunnel um, that pops you out somewhere else. Now, the idea of a wormhole is if you're sh shortcutting through space, you're shortcutting through time as well. So you would time travel. Now, the idea is completely possible. Physically and mathematically, wormholes can exist. The problem we found is if things go in, things should come out. So if we have a black hole where things are going in, we should have a white hole, things popping out. And people have looked for white holes, but we haven't found them yet. So wormholes may be something that we think could exist, that there's this way of, shortcuts through space and time, but it may just not happen. Great, thank you for that. Um, the next question is uh, about the research in outer space. Uh, one of the educators is asking that uh, they've read a lot about the research in outer space. Is tourism in space, say moon or Mars, feasible according to you? Mm. Good question. Um, they're different. <laughs> I think there, we will see a lot of activity around the moon and a lot of resource um, extraction around the moon. Mars is just a lot trickier, and it's all because of distance. It's all because of how far it is. If Mars is a lot closer, if Mars is the same distance as the moon, it'd be very different. But because it is so far away, the problems we'll encounter are, are pretty hard and pretty a lot and we just don't know a lot about it so i would definitely lean towards the moon thank you um the next one um is uh, related to uh sorry um uh, i think i've lost that question that's right <laughs> there's so many questions that are coming in so the next one is, is there anywhere on the Earth any, wor any work uh, that's going on in relation to developing artificial gravity within a space station, just as we have natural gravity on the Earth? Very good question. You know, one of the problems that would, one of the things that would solve all this is artificial gravity. Now, the way you create artificial gravity is you just create a force, right? So gravity is pulling us down this word. So we can use centrifugal force. And, you know, this is a simple experiment you can do, right? If you spin around in a desk chair or something that spins, as you're spinning around, there's a force pushing on you. Well, if you have a big ship that's spinning and it's spinning fast, it will create a force. And that force will be pushing back in towards the center where you are. And that would create gravity. It would create an artificial gravity. 
Now, people have calculated it, and people think it can work. The problem that we're finding uh, is the scale needed to do it is so big, it's pretty expensive. So it may be something that in the future can be done, but as of now, practically, it's probably too costly to do. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to take uh, last two questions. Um, the next one is, is it possible for latest scientific advancements to explain dark matter or energy by axiom theory, or is it still hypothetical? So, I mean, dark matter and dark energy are pretty, we're pretty strong in what we know they do and how they act. People have looked at axioms um, for a long time. But axions, which is, so for those who don't know, it's kind of a proposed model or, or particle that may explain this. It doesn't explain everything, and that's the problem. The best theory that explains how dark matter works and how dark energy works cannot be explained by a single field or force or new thing that interacts with both. So axions, as an idea, looked right um, for a is one of the theories, but the evidence that we have now for how we measure the effects of dark matter and where we see dark matter interacting isn't explained by axions, unfortunately. Thank you, that was very helpful. Uh, the last question, uh, many educators are asking about resources uh, that you could suggest or some of the websites that they can refer to to help uh, uh, make their students understand uh, these concepts in a better way because it becomes uh, difficult uh, for them to explain uh, students uh, such concepts. So any websites, any resources, any last tips that you have for them? Yeah, I mean, this is great. Um, as I said, there will be another, uh, if you look at the end of my slides, there will be another idea of a demo. Um, so I would search for Questacon, Q-U-E-S-T-A-C-O-N, and they're the Science Museum in Australia, and they have a whole section uh, on it. And in fact, the Australian Space Agency is building what's called the Discovery Center. And this will be um, a new uh, museum in South Australia, but a lot of their activities will be online. Um, uh, if you search for Mount Strum Observatory or the ANU Astronomy, and you go to our website, we have a whole section for resources for the public and students, um, videos, ideas, activities. Um, what are the other just simple things that you can do? Uh, is apps. There's a lot of free apps that allow you to tell you what's in the nighttime sky and information. Uh, the other, my favorite website is NASA Education, and they have a whole section based on different ages for different tips and ideas and um, areas that you can do. And for at least for at Mount Stroma and the ANU, all of this is contained both on our website and our Facebook page, that if you search for it. Um, and perhaps what I can do is I can send you a list and we can, I can compile it and then we can send it via an email to all the people who have participated and they can, I can send them the direct links as well. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for that. That would be very useful for all Thank educators. Right. So that brings us to the end of the session today. I'm sorry, we are not able to take all questions due to interest of time. But thank you again for your participation. Thank yes, you, thank Brad. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you, Brad, for such wonderful insights and an informative masterclass. Uh, we would like to conclude this masterclass by thanking all of you today and such great questions. We will send you a recording link to the webinar and the presentation in the next few days. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you all. Thank you, Brad. And thank you, the Central Board of Secondary Education, for partnering with Austrade. Good evening. Goodbye.